This is Ron Peters. I'm John Newton. And I'm Sam Long. Welcome to the After Class Podcast. Because the best conversations happen after class. Thanks for joining us in another episode of the After Class Podcast. We're glad to have you along. Uh, this has been a great week for two of the three of us in here. Some exciting things have been happening uh, in their lives. And by that, I mean not me, the other two. <laughs> <laughs> this being Sam. Uh, and so uh, you two have big announcements. So let's hear them. Ron? So I am a grandfather for the fourth time. Uh, biologically, I actually have five grandkids, but two of them are, are married into my family. So I got three biologicals. But number four has arrived. Nice. My daughter had her... Uh, baby, a couple days ago, a uh, little girl. Her name is Magnolia. So we call nice. her Maggie. It's a beautiful name. Yeah. She's a beautiful girl. Um, uh, it's funny because I got a call from my wife on Sunday. I was hanging out with some buddies up in DeWitt. And she calls me and she's like, Janelle's got to get to the hospital right now. I'm like, all right, I'm in. <laughs> so I had to leave DeWitt, drive down to Holt for people not around here. It's about a 25-minute drive. Take her to Grand Rapids, which was like another hour drive to get her to the hospital. Her husband was already there. That's why he wasn't able to drive her. Oh, gotcha. He was already in Grand Rapids. So it was fun. But the next day we got to meet her, and she is beautiful. I love having grandkids. So very exciting time for us. It's cool. Baby is cool. healthy? Yep. She did have to hang out a little while. She's having just a little bit of trouble breathing. Uh, they just wanted to make sure they had her on like a CPAP and stuff like that. But nope, she's doing really well. And it's more precautionary. They just yep. want to make sure she's sure. strong. Is she still on that? or She's out to CPAP. They're just watching her sugar levels right now. Okay. But she should be di- uh, discharged pretty soon. Mm-hmm. They're just monitoring really, her really close. She's a big baby. She's like 8'14". So 21 inches long. Oh, as a grandparent, you can uh, slip, uh, slip her a, a lollipop, get those sugar levels up. <laughs> for that. Yeah. There you go. Ice cream, what have you. Did Whatever you get the holder yet? Nope, haven't ho- held her yet, but I'm hoping to very, very soon. Yeah, she was still like on last time I saw her, she was still on the CPAP, so I wasn't able to actually pick her up. Pick her up. Right. But you're going to be a grandparent pretty soon here, John. So, yeah, in like 20 days. Yeah. So, how's that uh, soon? I, I keep I forgetting. Mean, maybe a little more, but like February 6th. So. Mm, okay. I haven't done the math since yesterday, so I've forgotten. <laughs> <laughs> well, I cannot wait for us to be able to start sharing notes on yeah. you know grandpa days. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. It's, Absolutely, it's pretty awesome. But that's not my big news. My big news is the publication of my 10th book. Woohoo, 10 books. That's yeah. amazing. It's uh, Six of them are projects that I edited. So I've just written chapters and showed oh, them. Oh, okay. that's or, what you're saying. Yeah. Uh, you know, brought together other work. But my fourth like book where I, I wrote the whole thing from beginning to end. Yeah. It's called The Fourfold Office of Christ, mm-hmm. A New Typology for Relating Church and World. And uh, I think we probably need to share that on our on our uh, Facebook so people can have a link to it. Yeah. But it's, it's a basic uh, book that talks about uh, how how should the church relate to the world. Mm-hmm. And in particular, it's wrestling with, like, Christians right now are really divided on how to relate. And so, some think we're, like, the prophets, the prophetic voice to the world, and some think we are servants of the world, like, looking for needs that they have and how we can be scrambled to meet them. Uh, some think we are kind of kingly figures in relation to the world, um, that you know, God wants us to get in positions of power so that we can make change from the top down and oh, yeah. make a positive impact and like impact legislation and other things. And and some view it kind of in a priestly way, where it's kind of like we just focus on spiritual things and let you know let the world handle all the physical things. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I, I developed this typology of prophet, priest, king, and servant, which is what I call the fourfold office of Christ, <laughs> and uh, kind of do the kind of a scriptural analysis of all these four different postures Mm -hmm. uh, and how they kind of give us a framework. Because, you know, whenever we wrestle with issues like how do Christians participate in election season, for instance, and there's a whole chapter at the end of the book that talks about election season. So hopefully for those who read the book, they can (laughs) enter into the election season and not make Jesus look bad. (laughs) Right. (laughs) If the church can just not screw up our witness to Jesus during election season. <laughs> uh, that would just be amazing for Christian witness in the United States. I know, right? Seems unlikely. <laughs> <laughs> right. But this book is really, you know, every time we come to an issue like that, or like Christians in the military, or Christians in legislation, or Christians mm-hmm. in positions of power in politics, or even like how do we relate to local agencies, that, you know, that are run by the government, and do we make strategic partnerships so that 
we can make a difference in the world or, or help yeah. those who are needy or use them as vehicles to relate to the widow and the orphan. Like, what kind of strategic partnerships alongside, beneath, over, like, how do we relate to these structures? And, and we all have a working theory in our head, mm-hmm. right, that, you know, a posture that we come from, yep. and, and it, it probably falls underneath the prophet, priest, king, or servant, like we're implicitly working with one of those frameworks, at how we think about how we should relate to worldly structures. Um, and what the book does is kind of, it gives the pros for each one. Like, what are the strengths of approaching the world from this posture? Yeah. And then evaluates it from a biblical standpoint. Like, do we have biblical reason to think this is the right way to relate? Or do we have biblical reason to, to say, this is a mistake to approach it from this posture, and it mm-hmm. compromises something that's really important about the church's witness? And, and so I kind of interrogate it. That, that's what the typology is, like the four different types of approach. Yeah. And then I, I recommend a, a, an approach which is kind of a revision of one of those four uh, that needs a little bit of help <laughs> <laughs> to come up with a, a positive suggestion of, of what that relationship with the world should look like. Gotcha. And I hope, I hope people are able to read it in time. <laughs> and uh, I, I think for some who've read it already, they've said, oh, wow, this is just diagnosing the problem oh, <laughs> that's wow. at the heart of of worldly division and it's giving me a handle like a reason to approach things from a, a particular way as a christian like yeah. what what difference does my christianity make in how i approach this upcoming election season and all the political mayhem that's about to <laughs> uh, transpire it's it's given people a handle to approach it christianly and unless you you know, it's not the kind of thing that you hear about in a sermon, right, or a right. Sunday school mm-hmm. class. How to participate in elections, you know, <laughs> right, unless yeah. there's some, like, we're bringing a politician in here to represent, you know, the assumed position that everyone, most people there will agree with, right? Like, yeah. we do a hard, we do a terrible job of educating people how to think Christianly about participating in, you know, worldly mechanisms of change. Right. And so, so I hope it's a resource that churches can use to study and to wrap their hands around it, and it's... It's thoroughly biblical in the way our podcast seeks to be bis- biblical. Yeah, uh, letting the scripture kind of set the guidelines for how we do it. So, so it's called the Fourfold Office of Christ. Please check it out on Amazon. As many of you who are willing, I really need some people to write some Amazon reviews. Yes, it's really important in the you know the first couple of months that we have multiple people who've kind of read it, evaluated it, said some things, rated it. That's so important to increase the visibility of the book. Um, but yeah, for like two weeks now, though, it's been the number one release in its category. Oh, wow. I'm I'm pretty happy. And and I've seen other books like drop in the ratings and move up in the ratings, but it's kind of holding in at number one. Yay, nice. So it's, uh, it's getting some traction, at least on Kindle sales. And that's, that's what they can easily track. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So I'm, I'm pleased with the launch of how it's going, but the quicker we can get some Amazon reviews, the better. So if you like the podcast, one of the ways you can thank me (laughs) is by... Um, taking the time to read the book and do a nice review. So thanks in advance for those of you who uh, do me that great favor. <laughs> so And maybe we'll talk about it as a podcast someday. Yeah, that'd be but, good. Uh, I have 100 books on order, so I can give them for, at, you know, at pretty much cost all my friends. <laughs> so Cool. All right. Well, with that good news in hand, I've got nothing. <laughs> my family had a long weekend because school was closed and Martin Luther King Jr. Day and then two more days of too cold to go to school situation. So they were just hanging out at home. So. <laughs> yeah. so that's why you've been in the office more. Now I get it. <laughs> Wait a minute. That's not true. I mean. All right. We're going to continue our Song of Songs study, and uh, we're going to pick up where we left off in Chapter 2. Uh, we got through the first uh, seven verses or so, and uh, the woman was speaking, and the man responded, and the so woman talks back to her friends. Yeah, uh, it's true. Ron likes to speak for women. I, I've, I've got. I've actually. <laughs> you know, I've, actually, there is a part of that <laughs> okay. that's kind of true. Oh no, kind of for true. women speaking <laughs> on behalf of women. Yeah. Oh, the okay, I would okay. Place it. <laughs> there, the way not, I would phrase it, to, yeah, no, no. not speaking for them, but speaking on their well, behalf. Okay. Yes. Thanks for. The rest of this chapter, Ron, I've got it figured out so that you can do the man's voice. There's, there's a, there's, yeah. He gets quoted, so you can do that part. Yay, I'm yeah. so happy you're, about You're that. welcome. I'm Yay. happy to do that for you. You know what? I'm going to remember this moment. Okay. It's going to be a special moment. So uh, I'm going to read 8 through the first part of 10, and then the, the man uh, speaks for a while till the end of 15, and then I'll pick up again at 16 and 17. Sound good? You can handle that? I think I can handle that. I don't think so because you're not in the right place. I can see it on your Bible right now. <laughs> you know what? <laughs> <laughs> All right, here we go. 
Chapter two. You know, we had such a good moment. You just had to ruin it, didn't yeah, you, Sam? Way to go. I, that's Way to what go. I do. <laughs> Enjoy it while you can. I'm, I know. I'm so devastated. So brief. Of people. <laughs> Here she says, the voice of my beloved. Look, he comes leaping upon the mountains, bounding over the hills. My belo- beloved is like a gazelle or a young stag. Look, there he stands behind our wall, gazing in at the windows, looking through the lattice. My beloved speaks, and he says to me. Oh, I didn't realize you I missed it. I blew it. I teed you up. You did, and I totally whiffed on it. Sorry. Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. For now the winter is past. The rain is over and gone. The flowers appear on the earth. The time of singing has come, and the voice of the turtle dove is heard in our land. The fig tree puts forth its figs, and the vines are in blossom. They give forth fragrance. Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. O oh, my dove, in the cleft of the rock is the covert of the cliff. Let me see your face, let me hear your voice, for your voice is sweet and your face is lovely. Catch us the foxes, the little foxes that ruin the vineyards, for our vineyards are in blossom. My beloved is mine, and I am his. He pastures his flock among the lilies. Until the day breathes and the shadows flee, turn, my beloved. Be like a gazelle or a young stag on the cleft mountains. Hmm. Oh, so that's nice. Beautiful. Oh, it is. Uh, and so she's speaking, and then, um, again, we uh, we don't know about the how the craftsmanship of this. Is she putting words in his mouth that she would like to hear, or is he actually oh, yeah. saying these things? Yeah. Regardless, there's kind of a, she's longing for him. Uh, he, she hears his voice in the distance, and then he arrives and speaks to her. And there's this great uh, imagery of him being uh, like, like a deer uh, that sort of wandering through. And <laughs> if anyone who's lived in the city or even in the country, every once in a while a deer just sort of sneaks up and yeah. peeks his head to the window, looks around, and like, you know, that's kind of the, the picture I get <laughs> where it's both a, a deer s- s- peeking through the window and the guy. <laughs> peeking through the window, yeah. right? I mean, it's, it's a little creepy. Yeah, it's, the it's, it's, it's a little bit, but I mean, if she's if she's longing for him to show up, it might yes, reminds me of like that I get. you know, reminds me of that kind of uh, teenage movie or show trope where the guy climbs up and peeks his head into the, oh, the, right. the bedroom, yeah. right? Yep. It's that yep. that sort of idea. Gotcha. Uh, that's going on there. Well, I mean, you know, for a lot of our listeners don't live in the state of Michigan. In Michigan, we have like a deer overpopulation problem, oh, yeah. and mm-hmm. so if you live in the city of Lansing. You routinely see deer walking through neighborhoods. Yeah. Like I've snapped pictures of deer walking through the neighborhoods, and so they're, they're in my side yard last night. Yeah. yeah. Well, I yeah. mean, I was looking out my window here in the office, and like half a dozen ran by just a couple of days ago, and so we're getting more and more used to the idea of deer, you know, just overpopulating these bigger cities. And so I think it's an image that more and more people could actually relate to. Yeah, and it's it's an image that shows up at the very end of the book. Matter of fact, in the last verse, it says, "Make haste, my beloved, and be like a gazelle or a young stag, mm. stag upon the mountains of spices." And that's kind of where it ends. And so here, and the reason I point that out is, I mean, it, it kind of argues for the unity of the song. Like these are not just random mm, poems. Right, yeah. There's some repetition at key places, some echoing of earlier statements, and um, and that's going to be important to any theory of how this book hangs together. And we're going to talk about different theories of how the whole book hangs together, but this language shows up more than once. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah, that's, I mean, it's that that's the image that shows up multiple times in this book of the, the guy as a stag or gazelle, uh, a bounding young <laughs> thing. <laughs> yeah, the language doesn't, isn't, to me, it's not particularly complimentary. Like, just the, when you read it, it's not how I think of like this, you know, kind of this masculine man kind of leaping and prancing like a, a young <laughs> well, stag or something like that. It just doesn't it doesn't work for me as like this. 21st well, it's interesting. American, it's yeah. interesting that, you know, we, we talk these days about guys who call them studs and a stud in reality is not a great term. either. <laughs> that's true. Right. Right. Yeah, and, yeah. And yeah, and that's what we kind of. So I, and I think in the mind of the writer, perhaps if you have like a stag who's going and. And you know, doing what stag, <laughs> doing what stags do um, to populate the, the the anyway. That's just something that's going on. Yeah. In eleven through thirteen, we have this kind of shift in seasons. Yeah. The winter is past. The rain is over. Uh, and you know, different seasons than our seasons, right? Winter yeah. is past. The snow is over. We would say, but you know, their winters are their rainy seasons. Right. right yeah. And especially in the Fertile Crescent, it's where they get the majority of their water for mm-hmm. the year. Right, I mean, they store up water in, in these rivers that flow until they dry up and 
in midsummer, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but so, you know, is this talking about a literal season? Hey, it's a change of seasons. Let's incorporate that into our song. Or is the seasons talking about their love? Right. right? Where like it's springtime for us. It's time for us uh, to come together. This, you know, the season of, you know, the uh, waiting, the anticipation, the building up. It's time for our love to blossom like right. spring. Yeah. And, and so uh, here, I mean, we know this is poetic language. Yeah. And so it's, it's sometimes it's tricky to figure out when it's being literal. Sometimes poetry uses language literally, mm-hmm. and sometimes poetry uses it metaphorically. Yeah. And, and this could be either. Yeah, well, and I mean, I like the, the, the more metaphorical use of the language because, like, you know, right now here in Michigan, we're in the midst of this massive cold snap. Where it's not just snow on the ground, but it is just ridiculously cold outside. And everything's just like in hibernation. You know, trees have no leaves on them. Snow's covering everything. And so the metaphorical image of like moving into spring where everything's coming alive, it doesn't matter if you're, you know, in the Fertile Crescent or here in Michigan. It's a beautiful image. I just like it because, you know... Trees begin to blossom and flowers begin to bloom. And it becomes like this really good image of love blossoming. We're not in hibernation. You know, we're just, you know, bundled up and, you know, that's about it. No, something is coming alive within us. I see, you know, this woman that I'm in love with and something just blooms inside of me. So, yeah, I really like the imagery of it. And in my ancient Near Eastern background, I can't help but read into there are various myths where, um, Right, one of the gods or goddesses dies, goes into the underworld, and the lover must come rescue them and bring them out, oh, and that's yeah. how they account for the changing of seasons. Yeah. So when the goddess of fertility goes to the deep, that's when fall hits, right? And things start growing, and then winter hits, and then why does spring come? Because she has been removed from that isolation mm-hmm. and comes back out again, and that kind of like that's. I don't know how much that's in here, but I, that's, I can't help but think of that, where there is this period of being frozen out, and then <laughs> yeah. now she's been brought back again, and so the love can be can flourish again, like the seasons flourish. Yeah, so, it makes me yeah. think of the, the Isis myth in yes, Egyptian exactly. mythology. Exactly. There's, I mean, there's Sumerian ones. Yeah. I mean, they all kind of have something like that. Makes sense. Yeah, I think there's something to be said about that in terms of this image can mean, like, you know, our love blossoms and starts to bear fruit, and it could be something about the... It's been kind of hidden. Hmm. It's been like maybe they're established in this relationship. They're falling for each other. Maybe maybe the brothers don't like what they see, but you know, and they still think maybe maybe they will come together. Maybe they won't. You know, they, they she has this weird relationship with her brothers. Maybe about this love relationship, and so this could be like it's time to go public. Hmm. Like it's time to make it known. And and part of why I think that is verse fourteen it says, "Oh my dove, in the clefts of the rock, in the covert of the cliff." You know, there's this hiddenness, right, tucked yeah. away. Th- these are places uh, in cliffs where animals kind of den, you mm-hmm. know, and they hide away. And, and this could represent, like, their, their kind of lover's getaway. Like, we, we saw in a previous poem this kind of, they're maybe together in this green area, like a lush area where there are um, evergreen trees, right? Yeah. It's almost like their little nook where they get together. This is almost another nook language except hidden away in the cliffs where animals hide for safety and lodging, but it's like, come out, right? Let me see your face. Let me hear your voice, for your voice is sweet and your face is lovely. Uh, there could be a sense of uh, someone's been hiding, <laughs> right? And, and maybe it's their love that has just, it's been underground for a while, like winter. Like everyone kind of nestles into their homes for the rainy season. And then once things dry up and they can all come out, there's a whole different social interaction in the ancient world when the rains are over and people can be outside more long days. Um, yeah. Maybe their love is in hiding and it's time for it to come out. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, that's, that's a classic romantic thing anyway. You know, the two lovers who are like sneaking around, getting away from mom and dad, getting away from brothers and sisters. You, know, you see that all the time. And so it's, it's very romantic, you know, sneaking out to meet each other. But it's, if, at some point, we're going to have to let everybody know we're in love. We're going to have to make this public. So I like the image of that as well. Yeah, I can see that. I can also see the, I mean, there's part of, that we're going to see throughout is sort of the the inability to find the the lover, right? The back and forth. And mm-hmm. so one of them is hiding and they, she's, and uh, he says, hey, come on out, let me see you. Because, you know, and so I think it's it maybe both, 
Yep. It could easily be both, uh, but that's just what I think of. Yeah, it is interesting, this peering into the window. Like, yes. It is, all of it's so covert. Yeah. You know, yeah. Like he's yeah. looking in on her. She yeah. wants, you know, it's like they they want to be together, but they're not quite able to. Mm-hmm. Or are they playing lover's games? Right. I mean, right. Like, you hard know, to, yeah. Yeah. hard to get. Like, you know, playing <laughs> hard to get. You know, she's like, oh, come find me. See if right. you can track me down. Not, not that I don't want you to find me, but I want to play a game. You know, I want you to work for it. Show me how bad... You want to find me. Yeah. So speaking of playing a game, I, I have a question for you guys. I, what do you think of verse 15? <laughs> Catch us the foxes, the little foxes that ruin the vineyards, for our vineyards are in blossom. Yeah. yeah. It's funny because I, I remember this line you know, from a long time ago, and I have no idea what to do with it. Catch us the foxes, <laughs> the, the little foxes. Like the big ones aren't a problem. It's just the little ones, you know, the baby ones. What are we talking about yeah. here? And who's catching whom? Like are they catching little foxes right. or is it like an invitation? Little foxes, catch us if you can. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, when you think about, so we think about when we've seen Vineyard before, so far, we're only in chapter two. Mm-hmm. And it's bef- chapter one where she talks about my vineyard I, uh, I have not kept. Right, it's this idea of, and that when we're talking about that, we're talking about the brothers who didn't like what was going on. That's one possibility. Yep. So now they're the foxes who are coming to ruin, like they're ruining the love, the vineyard. But like, yep. no, we'll be fine. <laughs> like, you're not going to mess with our vineyards. Or yep. is it just, is it people in general, or is it just difficulties? Like foxes, that's what they do. They're they're kind of like deer they're in that menace. sense. So they're going to yeah. come in, they're going to eat all your stuff. Like, no, those are my raspberries. And <laughs> oh, uh, don't talk to me about I, how deer ruin your stuff, man. You know all about. <laughs> I was it. looking right at you for that. <laughs> exactly. Um, and, and so, yeah. I, the, the for me the thing is when they're talking about the foxes they're the ones that are ruining the vineyards and so it seems like whatever the foxes are there's something that are they they are they're keeping this love from blossoming fully yeah mm-hmm. whatever it is could be the brothers could be the fact that they're um I mean, this goes back to well, what if one is Solomon and she's the maiden girl, right? Where she's not like the people would say, no, you're not allowed to have a relationship with her. Like, who knows what it could be? But it seems no. to be something that is keeping them from an obstacle. Yeah, from uh, fulfilling yeah. their love. And, and it, it ends kind of in an interesting note. Like, my beloved is mine. I am his. He pastures his flock among the lilies. And we've had that reference right. before. It goes back. But it ends with, you know, until the day breeze and the shadows flee, turn, my beloved, be like a gazelle or a young stag on the cleft mountains. It's, it's almost like she's saying, it's time to leave. Go. Mm-hmm. And is it like, you know, they're all brave and like, you know, who can stop us? Okay, now go home before someone catches us. <laughs> <laughs> it's almost like she's, is she sending him back or is she inviting, still inviting him? Um, I don't know. It's like she's. It sounds like okay. Now go. Be like a gazelle. Yep. Come close. Now get away. Okay. Come close. No. Yeah. Get away. Now, now use your speed to get away before we get caught. You know. Right. What? Yeah. I, yeah it's, it's it's a fascinating little verse there. <laughs> before we move on, I would like to uh, go full on allegorical interpretation, if I don't mind. Okay. <laughs> Here we go. Uh, there in verse fourteen, uh, it says the clefts of the rock and so forth. Uh, let me let me see your face. Your voice is sweet. I'm suggesting this is referring to the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls uh, <laughs> in, the, in the caves of Qumran. Uh, <laughs> oh, that's funny. Oh, that's I do what I can. Yeah, it, which makes you well, wonder, well, you know, when this is being interpreted allegorically, sure. does this mean, like I know, you know we've read earlier about her being dark-skinned but beautiful, right? Mm-hmm. And, and in the allegorical readings, uh, this is often referred to as Israel's time in slavery in Egypt. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Be, yeah. Being delivered. And, and now in, they're up in the mountain. Right, and, Sinai. And, and like God and them are forming yeah. this covenant, right? And of course, it, for Israel, it's a very literal covenant. And for Isra- for two lovers, it would be their marital covenant right. or coming together. But now there's this hiding in the clefts of the rock. You know, is this, you know, the safety of Sinai? Or like they're wandering in the wilderness. Mm-hmm. And, and so they're kind of hidden from the nations, they're not quite ready to go in, and they're settling in the area of Edom. They're yes, spending some time which there, are, which is known for rocks, right. cliffs. Like yep. ge- uh, geographically, it's a space of cliffs. Yeah, uh, which makes you wonder whether this is where they're at in that part of the story. Uh, but that's yeah. just to give you a sense of how the allegories function right. from them. It's like going through the events of Israel, and, and you can see parallels that work in a very concrete way. I guess I would think about Moses, you know, when he asked to see the face of God, had to oh, hide yeah. in the cleft of the rock. Mm-hmm. You know, you can't see my face, you can just see my fading glory. So it does take me back to that. Sure. 
Sure. Yeah, that's a whole yeah. other level. Yeah. <laughs> I showed my students uh, the Negev and Sinai pictures of it, and like, yeah, this is where they wandered around for 40 years. It sucks. <laughs> it's, just, it's, it's dry and craggy and rocky and mountainous, and it's not a great place to be. But yes. Yeah. So are we ready to move on? Sure. Sure. Why I've got my allegorical interpretation out there. Yeah. I mean, hopefully, we're just we're giving you enough of these sections where you can kind of see some possibilities sure. for yourself. Uh, so in three one, um, the woman is speaking. It seems to be just a change of scenery. Right? Yeah. Yeah. It's very it, it, definitely something else is going on, and that's a good chapter break for once. Yeah, and, and I'm going to read through verse 5, and then uh, there's going to be a response in 3-6 uh, from the maidens, the squad, as we have <laughs> grown to call them. So, But she says in 3-1, uh, Upon my bed at night I sought him whom my soul loves. I sought him but found him not. I called him but he gave no answer. I will rise now and go about the city, in the streets and in the squares. I will seek him whom my soul loves. I sought him but found him not. The sentinels found me as they went about in the city. Have you seen him whom my soul loves? Scarcely had I passed them when I found him whom my soul loves. I held him and would not let him go until I brought him into my mother's house and into the chamber of her that conceived me. I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, by the gazelles or the wild does, do not stir up or awaken love until it is ready. Hmm. All right. So we start with the context on her bed, and so this is what led this has led many interpreters to say this is a dream sequence, right? Where she's sleeping, she's you know wrestling, she's she's thinking of him. She can't sleep because she can't stop thinking of him. You know, just restless, and the rest of the that follows. And then with the whole going to search for him, she's not actually doing that. She's dreaming of doing that. That is one interpretation. Uh, what do you think about that as interpretation? I mean, I don't have anything against it. You know, it's. Like, I don't find it problematic. And it does have a very romantic feel to it. Again, you know, falling into this deep sleep where you're pursuing your lover, you can't find him, but then you do and bring him back home. Um, yeah, like I said, I just think it follows kind of a standard romantic trope that sometimes you see. So the idea of it by itself does not bother me as an interpretation. I mean, to me, it's highly likely. <laughs> well, I mean, what, what a beginning. Upon my bed at night, I sought him. What else could that mean? Right. <laughs> right. And, and so the question is not whether this is describing a dream or, a, I don't know, an awake right. <laughs> fantasy. I, I don't know. Right. But but whether this is the middle of the dream mm-hmm. or the beginning of a dream. Right. Like, it, has this whole thing been part of the dream and, and, right, and now it kind of acknowledges that reality or is this, you know, a self-contained dream sequence? Right. Or, or it's also she, she is dreaming. And then in verse two, though, she decides, she wakes up and says, oh, I, I got to stop. I got to get out of this. I'm going to go find him. Mm-hmm. I'm going to stop considering it and actually go do something about it. That's an also a possibility. Okay, as well. yeah. So um, it could be a transition within it. Right. Like so. she's, just, she's just restless because she can't stop thinking about this dude and needs to go find him. And that's a very. And then just randomly she finds him after being sure. beaten up. Sure. <laughs> no, no, that's not. She didn't get beat up this time. She gets beaten up the next time. Oh, right. I'm reading ahead. Yeah, well, it's it's actually a very similar thing that happens later. She goes looking for him, but it ends poorly for her. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, but yeah, e- either way, it's just for me that does sound very um, romantic comedy movie ish, yeah. where finally one of the persons realizes this is this is my, what have I been doing? I've been like they're right in front of me. I've got to like and so they go to find them and all the things that may or may not happen to discover the person. Like they're supposed to be getting on a plane. And they try to oh, get yeah. them, but they get there too late. But then they yeah. realize they're not actually <laughs> on the plane. They're right behind them. You know, that sort of thing. Oh, yeah. You've seen yeah. that. So, so yes. many different iterations of that same idea, right. without right. a doubt. <clears throat> and so she does. She wanders around looking for it, which, I mean, when you think about this and the, the next sort of repeated version of this that comes later, yep. um, it's not a great idea for women to walk around at night yeah. no. in that home place. <laughs> and so on the one hand, it's very bold, might be one way of putting it. Mm-hmm. Uh, some would say stupid, but definitely bold yeah. to go looking for him. And so it, it ends up well for her, but uh, it could easily have not have. Well, I could see her like running through the streets. It's not just you know walking around, looking in you know, doorways or around corners or whatever, but if we're going to kind of draw some of those sort of modern ways to think of it, like running through the streets trying to find him, you see some of the, you see the, you know, the night guards. Have you seen them like running past, right. you know, not even re- waiting for the answer? You keep running, running, running till you come around the corner and there he is. 
you know, and then like, you know, jumping into his arms. It's like, you got to come home with me kind of a moment. It's, you know, the music comes up and, uh, and it's this great moment, you know, in the movie. Yeah, yeah. And how this little poem ends is why I think the whole thing is a dream. Like it kind of ends with, you know, and I found him and I held him and I didn't let him go. And I brought him into my mother's house. And then like, I charge you not to awaken love before it's ready. It, it kind of ends with a, like an un, like as if things went bad, right? Mm. You know, like if it ended in verse four, like you know, I looked for him, I found him, and we were together. Mm-hmm. You know, um, so I warn you, girls, not to get into this whole love thing a- until the time is right. It's almost like like this is her longing. This is what she wants. It's the very thing that she hasn't been able to realize, but she longs for. And so it almost ends with the tone of this is an unfulfilled longing. Yeah. And therefore it transitions into this warning to her friends, which is a repeated warning, right? Right. We've seen this before. Have we seen it twice already? This is the second time, I believe. Okay, this is the second time. And there's going to be more. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so, but you have this repeated, you know, theme that we've seen in multiple poems, this kind of being separate coming together Mm -hmm. it's like that theme keeps happening over and again so to to clarify are you suggesting that one through four are this the stream sequence where it it does happen like she's it's almost like she like she has the fulfillment of all she's hoping for in her dream but then to her maiden she goes but that wasn't but it's not time yet like i want this just a dream right yeah interesting which makes it makes me think it's like a dream like it seems like when she addresses the maidens, the dream's over. Right. Five or, seems to be out of the dream. Yeah. Right. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, like she's having these, I don't know, dreams, fantasies. Like she's yeah. just relating her desire, her love, and what she imagines happening, and what her desires are. And then she turns to the ladies, and based on what I've just said to you, mm-hmm. here's a word for you to remember. Yeah. And, and that that repeated word to remember seems to be part of the book's message to us as readers. Like, it is a warning about the volatile, dangerous, precarious nature of, you know, passion, desire for a lover. Yeah. All right. Next Anything up. else? Then we keep going. Is Next it, up. I think it's, uh, John, your turn? No, I just read that. Did you? All right, I'll So read. there's going to be verse 6 and then 3 through 10a. <laughs> 7 through 10? That's fine. Well, yeah, first six, and then seven through ten. Eight. You said three. That's fine. Don't we do? Yeah, I do it all the time. <laughs> first six. What is that coming up from the wilderness? Like a column of smoke, perfumed with myrrh and frankincense, with all the fragrant powders of the merchant. Well, what is it? What is coming up? Let's find out. <laughs> Look! <laughs> it is the litter of Solomon. Around it are 60 mighty men. Of the mighty men of Israel, all equipped with swords and expert in war, each with his sword at his thigh because of alarms by night. King Solomon was made himself a palanquin from the wood of Lebanon. He made its post of silver, its back of gold, its seat of purple. Did I say that right, palanquin? Yes. That's how I say it. That's what I want to make (laughs) sure. So anyway, that's where I was supposed to stop, 10 a. You stopped with stone. Or in, oh, I'm sorry. In interior was laid with stone. Sorry, I left out that last line. Sorry about that. Okay. And I'll finish it from there. Daughters of Jerusalem, come out and look at King Solomon, at the crown with which his mother crowned him on the day of his wedding, on the day of the gladness of his heart. So we seem to have one woman talking, another woman sort of answering and describing, and then the same woman repeating again. That's one possibility. Yeah. It could be the same person doing the whole thing, but yeah. it's nice to have a little conversation. <laughs> yeah, I agree. So a significant change of gears from the previous For sure. Yep. Very different. <laughs> yeah, she's in a dream, and then all of a sudden it's like, hey, what's that? Solomon's here with his army. And like, so why why is Solomon showing up at their doorstep? The answer is it could be either actually like Solomon, um, and then this is where this is where obviously we get the idea of it being written for Solomon for one of his weddings. Like, oh, look at you and all your glory and your splendor. You know, you're awesome. It can't wait for your wedding day. Or it could just be um, like she's envisioning him, or they're envisioning the the, the man like Solomon, yeah. right, in his splendor. In the same way, you're like that guy. 
and so you know, remember, remember all the times you've seen Solomon come by with his army, which I'm not sure how often that would have happened. But <laughs> remember, like, yeah, you're just like that. You have all the splendor of Solomon, except you are not Solomon. So Solomon can be the man Solomon, yep. envisioned, whether envisioned in a dream or a, a fantasy or a literal conversation she's happening mm-hmm. as events are transpiring, as she and her friends are together. Hey, look, Solomon. Um, or that Solomon is kind of a, a symbol of her lover, right? Her, right. her kind of kingly fiancé, spouse, lover. Exactly. Um, yeah, in light of how the book ends, I kind of lean toward the first one. Mm-hmm. Like he's named a couple of times in the yeah. actual song. There's, you know, here she sees him from a distance and talks to her friends about him, how glorious it is. And then at the end of eight, she kind of, she's weighing, you know, Solomon can have all his, you know, concubines and fields and vineyards. I have my own vineyard. And it's like she's made a choice. Mm-hmm. And I wonder if this passage is not the presenting of another option. And it's funny you say that because that's exactly what I was thinking that. You know, Solomon just keeps showing up in the third person, almost as like a, a background character who's important for the story, but isn't like one of the main characters. And so Solomon becomes uh, a type of one temptation. You can be part of the royal party. She's so beautiful that you could have been taken into Solomon's harem, and you could have all the the benefits and everything that goes with being Sol- with you know part of Solomon's court. But you're just going to be a face in a crowd, just one of many. And so Solomon, in many ways, is kind of a foil rather than being the one whom her heart truly desires. So yeah, he kind of shows up at times in a way that celebrates the greatness of his glory, his kingship and everything. But it's more like, I could go that way, but I'm not going to. You know. So I, I kind of lean to what, towards what you were saying, John. If it was this passage alone, I'm not sure I would have gone there. But it's the way it ends, you know. When else, you know, when later on his name is invoked again, she's still talking about him in the third person, and she's rejected what he has to offer. That makes me think, you know, this is the raising of the proposition, or at least the conceptual possibility, even if it's not a real possibility, right? It's a conceptual possibility that she could have made a play to be part of Solomon's harem, yeah. to join, to, to be a part of a wedding party like that glorious one that everyone's watching pass by with his pal and Quinn. Yeah. <laughs> and that, that's an interesting, like, I'm not sure if I buy it completely, but the idea that it's not about the guy, it's about the girl. Like, mm-hmm. you're yeah. good enough to have been one of Solomon's. That's, yeah. that's fascinating to sort of consider as opposed to, uh, like, you know, extolling the guy like to yeah. be like Solomon. Yeah, and that's why I still, again, I don't know for sure. I'm still having, like, landed anywhere. But why I wonder if this poem was not written for the courts. Again, if Solomon's a foil... Well, the last thing you want to do is perform this before Solomon. Right. You know, is this more something that you know would be enacted around the campfire or on the streets, where Solomon shows up, but only as the alternative that gets rejected? You know, yeah. And it's the voice of the maidens throughout yeah. this, presumably. Right. I mean, it's possible she could be in the mix, but it seems to be the maidens who are having this con- conversation. Yeah. And at least putting before her, like, you know, what a wedding party should do, like, long before, you know. The bachelor party there should be the questions of you know there are other options out there mm-hmm. like before you like go all in on this one guy right like yeah. consider your opportunities consider the solomons consider the others and and that becomes for her a real possibility although she doesn't seem to dwell on it very much right yeah. but her friends are doing the talking at this point yeah before we move on should we talk about what a palanquin is sure <laughs> i would like to know what a palanquin is yes please. it's a big it's a seat it's a big, oh, like we might call it a throny type chair situation. And so, like, do people carry you around yeah. on it? That's the idea. Think Aladdin when he's coming into the city yeah. as Prince Ali. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so he's on his palanquin, is what you're saying. Yeah. All right. You know, I didn't know the word. We the probably could have found a better word, but that's probably the technical word for it. Okay. Yeah. Well, you know, it's the NRSV. They don't always choose the, the best Englishy words. That's that fair. Want. That's fair. And so it's, it's interesting, again, like, we have this language of mother, like yeah, at the crown with which his mother crowned him on the day of his wedding, and in the previous poem, like she wishes to take her lover home to the bedroom of her mom, right, right, like yeah. it's very woman centric. You just don't hear about the father of the bride, and it's even interesting that she, you know, her desire is to take him home to be with her, yeah, and her family, 
which which actually better lines up with you know how Genesis. Talks That's just about. what I was thinking. Yeah, Genesis too. Yeah, for this reason, a man will leave his parents' household and cleave to his wife. Right. That's what she's envisioning here, even though as you you know see in the patriarchal story, like you know uh, Jacob like goes to get a wife for himself and then mm-hmm. brings her well them <laughs> yeah. back to his land and his people. Uh, is that more the norm? Or is that the exception because of the whole promise to Abraham and like right. she's from Haran? And, right. uh, but at least this poem gives testimony to, you know, mothers, at least when it comes to the relationship between their daughters and um, their future spouse, right? They play a big role. It's the mother's house, yeah. it's the mother's blessing, it's the mother's sons who are just playing the role in this story. Well, I mean, like when. You know, when Abraham's servant goes and finds Rebecca, she leaves home to come to marry Isaac. There's no yeah. doubt about that. But with Jacob, like he goes to Haran and he ends up living with Laban. Now, part of it's because he's living with him. To, you know, Working out his debt. But, yeah. Right. Yeah. But even at that, when it comes time for him to leave, he sneaks off. Like <laughs> right. he, he does kind of join uh, Laban's household. And even his daughter, like his wives are eventually like, why should we stay here? We don't, know, we don't owe our dad anything. And so it's not like he took them away, but when the time came, like I said, they had to sneak off. And so there's something about that that's a little bit more Genesis 2. And you're right, I I didn't pick up on that, but you kind of catch that here in Song of Songs as well. Yeah, except it's not, you know, in Genesis, it's the bride's father you hear about over and over again. Right. And here it's the bride's mother, Mm -hmm. or, or the groom's mother, whom you hear about. Yeah. You know? So it's just a it's just a witness and a testimony to practice. You just assume when you read like the patriarchal narratives and other passages, that it's all about the dads. This is a book that stands in contrast to that. Yeah, that mothers played a significant role. They had voice. They had agency. They had homes. Right. That are theirs. Um, it, it's just it's it's a counter voice. I, I think mm-hmm. needs to be heard. Well, and I still wonder just how much what kind of a role that moms play. It's like when it came to arranging marriages. Were dads more bit players? You know, was it the moms who really played the key role? Again, we assume what life looked like in ancient Israel, but different passages in the Bible may give us a, a better look at it to say, what you're thinking is not the way it was. Moms worked this out. Dads had a role to play, but they sort of step in, you know, maybe at like the final word or whatever. Right. You know, we might be getting a much better idea of what ancient Israel was like. It reminds me of uh, if you've seen the the series, the marvelous Mrs. Maisel. Her mom ends up being like a a matchmaker, bringing these people together and saying, "Oh, oh yeah. we're going to make this happen." You know, just it is. It's funny these these societies where these cultures where that's part of the, what they do. Yeah, it's just so foreign to us about having the input of the parent or really the the pushing forward of the parent. To say this is the match. You can deal with it. Well, I mean, it does make me think of um, you know. Uh, like the story of Tevye, and there's that whole song, Matchmaker, Matchmaker, Make Me Match, where it is a woman. And we can think of that as a modern thing, but maybe it reflects a very ancient custom about who's more responsible for bringing people together. Yeah, and this and, well, this, is, this is totally a side. I'll complete conjecture, but there's the who actually does the work and who gets the credit for the work, right? <laughs> right yeah. Yeah. So right. the guy, yeah. the men are going to go to the elders, the gate, and you know do all the things they got to do to make it official, whereas the mom's the one who put it together, possibly, right? Yeah, that, yeah. right. That's uh, always on the table. Exactly. As we know in uh, other, lots of other realms, yeah. the woman behind the scenes. Yeah. Yeah, and I like it because it just gives us the other side. Yeah, I agree. And I, it's not that in these relationships the fathers were entirely absent. Right. Right, yeah. Yeah, I, I would just say one more thing about this poem. And when it talks about Solomon, um, it's not, I mean, it's all about the his wealth. Yes. Right? Yeah. It's all about his, his possessions, his men, his strength, his palanquin, which he made from the wood of Lebanon, which is, you know, the best, you know, <laughs> yeah. it's the Home Depot Cedars of, of Lebanon, uh, yeah. <laughs> Palestine. <laughs> like, it's the best stuff, right? And it's the seats of purple, inlaid with stone like it, it's it's all about the magnificence and grandeur of Solomon not his desire as a lover right. mm-hmm. or his attractiveness to her or to the women it's just about his greatness yeah and you know when he shows up at the end of the poem it's going to be very similar 
Yeah, it's yeah. about his his greatness, and I, thematically, I think it's important. I agree, especially if you're trying to make a case where it's Solomon all the way through as the male. Like this is weird, kind of out of place because those feelings she just had and previously don't seem to be attached to Solomon. Mm-hmm. Right, right. He's a, he's just the 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 picture of. Uh, like you say, grandeur and power. The guy the, who has it all. Right, yeah. but not the picture of the guy she's desperately in love with. Well, yeah. and that's really, I think that's an important consideration because there are some people, men or women, who are drawn to a spouse because of their wealth. Like, what am I going to get out of this? You know, their wealth is going to be beneficial to me. It'll increase my status and all that kind of stuff. But in Song of Songs, you know, this girl is attra- attracted to the guy. It's not your status or your wealth or anything that you can do for me. I love you for who you are. And that's an important distinction. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, wait, we actually got through quite a bit. You know, not a chapter and a half. Well, we're, we're cranking it up. <laughs> we're moving. Yeah, and the next chapter, when we do next week, is going to be like one long poem. Yeah. So uh, oh, yeah. we might get a couple of chapters done. Next. We'll see. What I think we we're do. on a two-chapter pace, one and a half to two chapters. It's That's not, not going to be a 15-episode uh, uh, series. No. Yeah, thank goodness <laughs> for that. All right. Well, in the meantime, thank you so much for joining us in this week's episode of the After Class Podcast. After Class, because... The best conversations happen. After Class. Thank you for listening to this episode of the After Class Podcast. ACP is hosted by Sam Long, John Nugent, and Ron Peters. Audio production is provided by Drew Nyquist. Social media is managed by Darren Harris.